hear the bells, so that means the procession is about to begin. Um, there will be uh, the, the servers and the, and the um, concelebrants and the deacons who will be serving at the Mass today and our wonderful Bishop uh, Ned Schlesinger. Of course, the Knights of Columbus, we can't forget. We see them coming in now in their the fourth degree honor guard. You know, Father, we've been blessed to have the Knights of Columbus with us here. And uh, you see that beautiful shot of all the people that are with us this afternoon. And the Knights of Columbus have been with us for many years. So let us enjoy this moment uh, as our priests process out and to begin uh, preparation for the celebration of the sacred uh, liturgy. Absolutely. We have a beautiful choir here from uh, Madeline College. Of po po um, so let's listen to them as we see the procession coming in.
In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Peace be with you. And with your spirit. Indeed, we're thankful for the Lord, at least for the good weather we have today. And we thank especially our Lord for the divine mercy. Dear Pilgrim, to those watching around the world, on behalf of the Marians of the Immaculate Conception, I extend a warm welcome to you on this Feast of the Divine Mercy on this second Sunday of Easter. And after a three-year hiatus, we are excited to be back to our full public-scale celebration of this great feast day. And we thank God. <laughs> and we thank God who seems to be welcoming us in this conclusion of the Easter octave by overnight, you know, the, the spring rising up, the leaves budding forth completely overnight behind us. And so we thank God for this great welcome. My name is Father Matthew Tomini, and I'm currently serving as the rector of the National Shrine of the Divine Mercy here on Eden Hill in Stockbridge, Massachusetts. And we would like to extend a warm welcome to His Excellency Bishop Bernard Schlesinger, since 2017, Bishop Schlesinger has served the Archdiocese of Atlanta as their auxiliary bishop. On this Divine Mercy Sunday, the octave day of Easter, we thank God for providing us poor sinners a refuge and shelter in the very depths of his tender mercy. On this great feast of mercy, the Lord opens completely the floodgates and pours out a whole ocean of graces upon those who approach the fount of his mercy, offering complete forgiveness of sins and punishment to those who have gone to confession and receive Holy Communion today. We barely understand what an awesome gift the Lord offers us today, as we will never fathom God's mercy but nonetheless, we come to worship him in humble thanksgiving. Dear brothers and sisters, let us humbly beseech the Lord our God to bless this water he has created, which will be sprinkled on us as a memorial of our baptism. May he help us by his grace to remain faithful to the spirit we have received. Lord our God, in your mercy be present to your people's prayers. And for us who recall the wondrous work of our creation and the still greater work of our redemption, graciously bless this water. For you had created water to make the fields fruitful and to refresh and cleanse our bodies. You also made water the instrument of your mercy, for through water you freed your people from slavery and quenched their thirst in the desert. Through water, the prophets proclaim the new covenant you were to enter upon with the human race. And last of all, through water, which Christ made holy in the Jordan, you have renewed our corrupted nature in the bath of regeneration. Therefore, may this water be for us a memorial of the baptism we have received, and grant that we may share in the gladness of our brothers and sisters who at Easter have received their baptism. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. We humbly ask you, Almighty God, be pleased in your faithful love to bless this salt, which you have created, for it was you who commanded the prophet Elisha to cast salt into the water, that impure water might be purified. Grant, O Lord, we pray, that wherever this mixture of salt and water is sprinkled, every attack of the enemy be repulsed and your Holy Spirit may be present to keep us safe at all times. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen.
May Almighty God cleanse us of our sins and through the celebration of this Eucharist, make us worthy to share at the table of his kingdom. in excelsis Deo. Let us pray. God of everlasting mercy, who in the very recurrence of the Paschal Feast kindled the faith of the people you have made your own, increase, we pray, the grace you have bestowed, that all may grasp and rightly understand in what font they have been washed, by whose spirit they have been reborn, by whose blood they have been redeemed. Through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, God forever and ever. Amen. 
a reading from the Acts of the Apostles. They devoted themselves to the teaching of the apostles and to the communal life, to the breaking of bread and to the prayers. Awe came upon everyone, and many wonders and signs were done through the apostles. All who believed were together and had all things in common. They would sell their property and possessions and divide them among all according to each one's need. Every day they devoted themselves to meeting together in the temple area and to breaking bread in their homes. They ate their meals with exaltation and sincerity of heart, praising God and enjoying favor with all the people. And every day, the Lord added to their number those who were being saved. The word of the Lord. Lectura de la Primera Carta del Apóstol San Pedro. 
Bendito sea Dios, Padre de nuestro Señor Jesucristo, por su gran a, misericordia, a first letter of Saint Peter. porque al resucitar Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who in his great mercy gave us a new birth to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who, by the power of God, are safeguarded through faith to a salvation that is ready to be revealed in the final time. In this you rejoice, although now, for a little while, you may have to suffer through various trials, so that the genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold, that is perishable, even though tested by fire, may prove to be for praise, glory, and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Although you have not seen him, you love him. Even though you do not see him now, yet believe in him. You rejoice with an indescribable and glorious joy as you attain the goal of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Se llenan de una alegría radiante y indescriptible, seguros de alcanzar la salvación de sus almas, que es la meta de la fe. Palabra de Dios. Vamos, Señor.
Lord be with you. And with your spirit. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to John. Glory to you, o Lord. On the evening of that first day of the week, when the doors were locked, where the disciples were for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood in their midst and said to them, Peace be with you. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. The disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. Whose sins you forgive are forgiven them, and whose sins you retain are retained. Thomas, called Didymus, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples said to him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands and put my finger into the nail marks and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. Now a week later, his disciples were again inside, and Thomas was with them. Jesus came, although the doors were locked, and stood in their midst and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands, and bring your hand and put it into my side, and do not be unbelieving, but believe. Thomas answered and said to him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, have you come to believe because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and have believed. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples that are not written in this book. But these are written that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that through this belief you may have life in his name. Al anochecer del día de la resurrección, estando cerradas las puertas de la casa donde se hallaban los discípulos, por miedo de los judíos, se presentó Jesús en medio de ellos y les dijo, La paz esté con ustedes. Dicho esto, mostró las manos y el costado. Cuando los discípulos vieron al Señor, se llenaron de alegría. De nuevo les dijo Jesús, la paz esté con ustedes. Como el Padre me ha enviado, así también los envío yo. Después de decir esto, sopló sobre ellos y les dijo, reciban el Espíritu Santo. A los que les perdonen les, los pecados, les quedarán perdonados, y a los que no se los perdonen, les quedarán sin perdonar. Tomás, uno de los doce, a quien llamaban el gemelo, no estaban con ellos cuando vino Jesús, y los otros discípulos le decían, hemos visto el Señor, pero él le, les contestó, si no veo en sus manos la señal de los clavos, y si no meto mi dedo en los agujeros de los clavos, y no meto mi mano en su costado, no creeré. Ocho días después, estaban reunidos los discípulos a puerta cerrada, y Tomás estaban con ellos. Jesús se presentó de nuevo en medio de ellos, 
y les dijo, la paz esté con ustedes. Luego le dijo a Tomás, aquí están mis manos, acerca tu dedo, trae acá tu mano, métela en mi costado y no sigas dudando, sino cree. Tomás le respondió, Señor mío y Dios mío. Jesús añadió, tú crees porque me has visto, dichosos los que creen sin haber visto. Otras muchas señales hizo Jesús en presencia de sus discípulos, pero están escritos, pero no están escritos en este libro. Se escribieron estos para que ustedes crean que Jesús es el Mesías, el Hijo de Dios, y para que creyendo tengan vida en su nombre. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. St. Faustina wrote, all, gross, all grace flows from mercy. Even if a person's sins were as dark as night, God's mercy is stronger than our misery. One thing alone is necessary, that the sinner set ajar the door of his heart, be it ever so little, to let in a ray of God's merciful grace and then God will do the rest. For those watching and for those here at the National Shrine of the Divine Mercy, be confident that God's mercy is stronger than any misery you may be experiencing at this time. We who hope for a fulfilling life and a bright future need only open the door of our hearts to God's merciful grace in order to find interior peace and experience unending joy. On the day of the resurrection, Jesus did not reproach his disciples because of their sins, nor reprimand them for having abandoned him out of fear. He spoke simply words of peace and reconciliation to them. In today's gospel, Jesus did not show his open wound to St. Thomas so that he could make him feel shame for doubting. Jesus showed his open wound in order to deepen Thomas's faith so that we can say with Thomas, my Lord and my God. Brothers and sisters, assuredly, it is not the justice of God that pursues us all the days of our life. It is the mercy of God, as we hear the 23rd Psalm, only his goodness and kindness and mercy pursues us all the days of our life. Today we celebrate the love of God, the word made flesh, the risen Lord come to save, the divine mercy which restores life and hope to, an to a troubled and uncertain world. On this Divine Mercy Sunday, I would like to reflect upon two points, two particulars. The first point is an invitation, and we must RSVP, the invitation to trust in and receive his mercy 
as we celebrate the feast of divine mercy and gaze upon the image of the divine mercy. And the second point is we are all called to be missionaries and heralds of the divine mercy and instruments of God's peace. So first, the invitation to trust in Jesus as the divine mercy. What captures our attention as we gaze on the image of the divine mercy is that there's a movement forward by the Lord towards us. The Lord is not pulling back from us like we might do when trying to settle a score from injuries received. The Lord's right hand is raised in blessing and his left hand points to the center toward his heart, which was pierced, the source of mercy and love. Jesus is not waiting for us to get it right so that we might become lovable or acceptable to him. Jesus is not watching us from a distance like a spectator in a stadium. He is not acting like a referee who must give penalties for fouls and infractions. Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever, and his mercy endures forever. We see rays radiating from his heart that symbolize life and healing available to us in the sacraments. Jesus invites all who are weary and find life burdensome to come back to him. He simply wishes to instill peace in our souls, greater confidence in his person, so that we may see ourselves in a better light through his heart. When justice alone preoccupies our attention, rather than confidence in God's mercy, we are prone to fear that our past will hold us back from moving forward into the future, or fear that what might happen in the future if we fail. The apostles were in a locked room in today's gospel for fear of what was outside. In today's gospel, we see how Jesus invites Thomas to look beyond his doubts. We must, like Thomas, look towards his wounds and deep, deepen our faith in him who is our light and salvation. Let us look for a moment of some scriptures which can help us understand and refocus when we are prone to doubt the divine mercy. It's very simple. We can open the book of Genesis and read the story about Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, who played, by the way, the first game of hide-and-seek in human history. As you know, at the start of this children's game, one is to outsmart the seeker, to be more cleverer than the seeker, and never be caught. In some forms of the game, the hiders try to run back to home base while the seeker is away looking for them. But how can we find a true home if God is not waiting there for us in his mercy. In the case of our first parents, they thought they could be gods who were self-satisfied, self-sufficient, self-confident, ultimately selfish, in their own estimation of their power, and in the end became quite blind to the goodness and mercy of God. As a consequence, they tried to remain hidden because they were ashamed. When discovered, they played another game of passing blame rather than focusing on the magnanimity of God who is love. Fortunately, God is searching for them and inviting them to come out into the open and listen to the first announcement of salvation for them. God's question, where are you, shows concern for those living in fear when they feel that God is displeased with their actions. This reminds me of a quote from a Franciscan author, Father Murray Bodo, who writes, the reason we don't become saints 
is not that we cannot overcome sin, but that we are unwilling to overcome shame. Shame is not a problem for God. The only problem which holds us back from believing in the wideness of God's mercy is our unwillingness to turn to God to be restored to living again as his beloved children. A second example in the Gospels, in the well-known parable of the lost or prodigal son, we have a glimpse into the heart of a father not waiting at home for his children to come back to him to make a confession of sin. The father first in the parable runs with joy to his son who is still at a distance. There is not one mention of punishment, nor a word said from disappointment relating to his son's waywardness and dissolute living. The father simply invites him to celebrate a feast like today, a feast of mercy, which is prepared by the father. With the older son in this parable, the father has to leave the feast to implore with him to celebrate the restored life of his younger brother. Here we see how mercy goes farther than justice. Mercy rules the day rather than rewards and punishments related to good and bad behavior. This reminds me of a quote by the famous theologian, Father Romano Guardini, in his book, The Lord, who says, yes, justice is good, is the foundation of existence, but there is something higher than justice, the bountifully widening of the heart to mercy. Justice is clear, the one, but one step further, it becomes cold. Mercy is genuine, heartfelt. When backed by character, it warms and redeems. Justice regulates, orders existence, Mercy creates. Justice satisfies the mind that all is as it should be, but from mercy leaps the joy of creative life. In both scriptures from the Old and New Testaments, we can see the greatness of God who opens up for us a new horizon of living in peace and full of joy. The second point to become missionaries or heralds of divine mercy in the instruments of God's peace. Peace be with you, we heard twice in today's gospel. It was the first greeting of Jesus on the day of the resurrection. It was bestowed on the apostles on the second week, the Sunday. It is repeated by every bishop at the beginning of the mass when he greets his brothers and sisters with Christ's peace. Our mission of bringing peace to a troubled world begins when we begin to place confidence in Jesus as the divine mercy, knowing that nothing can separate us from the love of God. We become missionaries like St. Mary Magdalene, who became the apostle to the apostles and the first to proclaim the resurrection of the Lord. We imitate the wisdom, the great doctor of the church, St. Therese of Lisieux, the little flower, who writes so wonderfully about God's mercy in this passage. She says, it is not because I have been preserved from mortal sin that I lift up my heart to God and trust in love. I feel that even had I in my conscience every crime one could commit, I should lose nothing of my confidence but my heart broken with sorrow, I would throw myself into the arms of my Savior. I know that he loves the prodigal son. I have heard his words to St. Mary Magdalene, to the woman taken in adultery, and the woman of Samaria. No one can frighten me, for I know what to believe concerning his mercy and his love. And I know that all that, that all that multitude of sins would disappear in an instant, even as a drop of water cast into a flaming furnace. Our anchor then must be in the divine mercy, and this must be proclaimed especially to the young today, 
especially when they fail to reach their dreams and discover their powerlessness and weakness and are prone to despair. We are to teach the nations that the greatest blessing in life is not recreating oneself into an image of one's own imagination. We cannot turn a blind eye to moral relativism that is rampant today. If we do this, we do not show love or mercy. Rather, we, allow our, we cannot allow others to distort the meaning of freedom as a license to do as one reasons without reference to the good of others or the dignity of the human person created in God's image and likeness. The proclamation of the gospel and the teaching of the church is always a proclamation of truth and of mercy. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. But we must teach and preach in love. In addition, we need to help all who feel that they're alone without the love of others and God's help. We need to help them ponder the message of mercy like St. Peter. He did not focus on a resume of past accomplishments in order to press, impress God or others. St. Peter denied Jesus, not once, but three times. And this could have been on his resume. But Peter never retreated from becoming a fisher of men. Jesus never gave up on Peter, who in turn never gave up on Jesus and moved forward to tend the flock of Christ in mercy. Mercy is the path of the church where we must always take the lead like Jesus moving toward us and offering a find a, to find a place in his heart. This message is constantly being proclaimed by our Holy Father, Pope Francis, who never tires of quoting his first his predecessor, the late Pope Benedict XVI. Being Christian, is not the result of an ethical choice or a lofty idea, but the encounter with an event, a person, the divine mercy, which gives life a new horizon and a decisive direction. Pope Francis challenges us to present our parishes as field hospitals and islands of mercy, knowing that the church cannot teach doctrine from behind the walls of tribunals to those who are struggling with little hope. We are being sent into the marketplaces, into a troubled world where mercy gives a future filled with hope. We are to lead like the Good Samaritan with mercy, to lead with the victims rather than a sense of self-righteousness or some feeling of resentment. We also must refrain from allowing any bitterness or anger to fester in our hearts so that we be then become resentful. This reminds me of the Nobel laureate Nelson Mandela, who spent 27 years in captivity during the apartheid era. And he wrote, as I walked out the door toward the gate that would lead to my freedom, I knew if I didn't leave my bitterness and hatred behind, I'd still be in prison. When we leave Mass today, what attitudes will we carry away from the Mass? Do we feel as if others owe us something or we hold them accountable until our sense of justice is served? Will we exact a payment of debts owed and forget the great price that was paid to cancel out our own debt? Will we live the message of mercy that we draw from the Eucharist and imitate Jesus and his sacrifice. Let us hope this will be the case, for the church of the future must be a Eucharistic church living the message of divine mercy. And finally, in conclusion, why does God put up with us and pursue us even on the second Sunday of Easter? There can only be one answer because he loves us and his mercy endures forever. And peace 
is his gift and only he can give it. Jesus said to St. Faustina, mankind will not have peace until it turns to the font of my mercy. So on this Divine Mercy Sunday, I say with our Lord to all of you here and those who are watching, peace be with you. And at the end of the Mass, the deacon will say, or after the adoration, go in peace. I pray that you will discover that peace which only Jesus can give, that you'll experience healing from his merciful heart, and that you, in turn, will become the instruments of his peace in proclaiming the divine mercy. God bless each and every one of you watching today and those who are here and your families.
my brothers and sisters, with the joy of Christ rising from the dead, let us turn to the Father of mercies. He heard and answers the prayers of the Son he loves so much. Let us trust that he will hear our petitions. For our church, that she may grow in reverence, love, and devotion to our risen Lord, present in the Eucharist. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For our Holy Father, Pope Francis, and all bishops, priests, and deacons, that they may be granted wisdom and fortitude in upholding the teachings of Christ and his church. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For the civil leaders, that they may govern in accordance with the natural law, with justice for families, and all, with mercy for the unborn, the elderly, the poor, and the oppressed. Let us pray to the Lord. The persecution in the world entier, afin qu'il cherche et trouve and find refuge in the town of the tender mercies of our Lord. Notre Dame. Let, Let us pray, us to, pray the to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For our youth, that they may be protected from all evil and would generously follow the Lord's call to follow him in the priesthood, religious life, and holy matrimony. Let us pray to the Lord. In Tagalog, for the sick, and the dying, especially those most in need of divine mercy, that they will have great trust in the inexhaustible fount of God's mercy. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord. For all those who do not know the mercy of God, and are separated from his church, that they may return to the Father's home and receive, receive his merciful embrace. Let us pray to the Lord. For all the members of the Association of Marian Helpers and the Confraternity of the Immaculate Conception, both living and deceased, and for all the intentions they have entrusted to the congregation of Marians. May the Lord favorably hear their prayers and strengthen them in faith, hope, and charity. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord hear our prayer. For all the deceased who have passed away due to war, illness, natural disasters, and suicide, May they receive the Lord's mercy and rest in peace. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. Heavenly Father, bless those who have placed their trust in your infinite goodness. We ask that you hear and answer our prayers according to your most holy will, which is love and mercy itself. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. White bucket at the beginning of your row and passing it across your row. We truly appreciate your generosity in helping us to offer the celebration of the Divine Mercy in Stockbridge. Ahora tomaremos una colecta. That beautiful choir that we've been hearing today is the Polyphony uh, Choir of Magdalen College in New Hampshire, and they're just uh, wonderful, so we'll continue to listen to them throughout the day on this beautiful Mercy Sunday. At the back of the um, altar is a beautiful prayer banner. Can you tell us about that, Father Chris? Yeah, each year, Father Joe, um, we've offered our Marian helpers something special for Divine Mercy Sunday. 
It's always been an honor for us to have everybody here, part of our Marian family. And once again this year, we've invited them to write their prayer intentions on those cloth squares. Um, more than 20,000 people have responded. This is amazing. And their squares have been made into this beautiful banner that emphasizes the necessity of coming together um, as Marian helpers, part of our family, to promote divine mercy, even if it's just in your own suffering in your own home. It's There's many ways we can do that. So those that didn't make it into the banner are placed near the altar included in the prayer. So everybody, everybody is there. So each square, as you can see the cloth on your screen right there, um, each square of cloth represents a prayer intention from, as we mentioned, one of our Marian helpers. How amazing. Uh, and we pray for their intentions, especially today and throughout the whole year. So if God puts it on your heart, I encourage you to consider being part of our Marian family. That way next year we can include your prayer intentions as well. So that banner, Father Joe, is just a reminder to all of us to put our trust in God. Amen. Well, the collection continues to be taken today. We had a beautiful homily from uh, Bishop Schlesinger today. He had some interesting images in there. He talked about in the book of Genesis, after the original sin, it was the first game of hide and seek, he said. <laughs> God was looking for Adam and Eve. Adam and Eve wanted to hide. And in hide and seek, you don't want to be found. But Jesus wants to find us. And we shouldn't be ashamed. I loved how he pointed out that no sin is greater than the mercy of God. And... Um, no matter what, we are broken, we know this, but God's mercy is greater. And so, you know, he brought up the world today. He brought relativism, which is a huge problem that most of us um, seem to think it's, it's, it's the way of the world that dictates our future. No, what, what you're seeing here is what dictates our most important future, the eternal destiny. And so praise be to God for good bishops that... Uh, like Bishop uh, Ned that, that gave us the truth there in the homily. Yeah, and, and he said something beautiful about shame there, as you mentioned. He said sometimes it's shame that holds us back, and we're afraid to, to uh, go toward God because of our shame. But he says shame is not a problem for God. God can re re uh, pardon us. He can uh, forgive us. And so he can get rid of the shame for us. So we shouldn't let that shame hold us back. And that's the whole uh, promise of today's feast. Uh, Jesus, as we started to mention in the pre-show, and hopefully at the end of the liturgy, we'll talk a bit more about, and that is this extraordinary promise that Jesus promises today to the soul uh, that has been to confession, so you're in a state of grace, and now receives Holy Communion. And please don't worry if your priest didn't mention it. Um, any Mass, any receiving of Holy Communion today, and you can receive the complete forgiveness of not only all sin, but all punishment. Father Joe, as our beloved Father Seraphim always said, it's like a second baptism, because not only is the sin wiped away, but so is the punishment. Amazing. Amen. Amen. The Lord is so generous on this great day, so let's open our hearts to Him. Uh, We'll also, for those of you who are at home and can't get to Mass today, we'll make a spiritual communion together. And so all of the Lord doesn't want anything to stop us from receiving these graces That's of Mercy right. Sunday. And speaking of the beautiful, beautiful grace of the day, let's listen a little more to the choir as they prepare us um, for the reception of this uh, most incredible gift of our Lord in the, in the Holy Eucharist. Amen.
pray, brothers and sisters, that my sacrifice and yours may be acceptable to God, the Almighty Father. Accept, O Lord, we pray, the oblations of your people and those you have brought to new birth, that renewed by confession of your name and by baptism, may remain, may remain, they may attain unending happiness through Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and just. It is truly right and just, our duty and our salvation, always at all times to acclaim you, O Lord. But on this day, above all, to laud you yet more gloriously when Christ our Passover has been sacrificed. For he is the true Lamb who has taken away the sins of the world. By dying, he has destroyed our death and by rising restored our life. Therefore overcome with past joy, every land, every people exalts in your praise, and even the heavenly powers with the angelic <coughs> host sing together the unending hymn of your glory as they acclaim. To you, therefore, most merciful Father, we make humble prayer and petition through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, that you accept and bless these gifts, these offerings, these holy and unblemished sacrifices, which we offer you firstly for your holy Catholic Church. Be pleased to grant her peace, to guard, unite, and govern her throughout the whole world, together with your servant Francis, our Pope, and William, our Bishop, and all those with me, your one worthy servants, and all those who, holding to the truth, hand on the Catholic and apostolic faith. Remember, Lord, your servants and all gathered here whose faith and devotion are known to you. For them we offer you this sacrifice of praise, or they offer it for themselves and all who are dear to them for the redemption of their souls in hope of health and well-being and paying their homage to you, the eternal living God, living and true. celebrating the most sacred day of the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ in the flesh, and in communion with those whose memory we venerate, especially the glorious ever-Virgin Mary, Mother of our God and Lord Jesus Christ, and blessed Joseph, her spouse, your blessed apostles and martyrs, Peter and Paul, Andrew, James, John, Thomas, James, Philip, Bartholomew, Matthew, Simon and Jude, Linus, Cletus, Clement, Sixtus, Cornelius, Cyprian, Lawrence, Chrysogonus, John and Paul, Cosmos and Damian, and all your saints, we ask that through their merits and prayers, 
in all things will be defended by your protecting help. Therefore, Lord, we pray, graciously accept this oblation of our service, that of your whole family, which we make to you, also for those to whom you have been pleased to give the new birth of water and the Holy Spirit, granting them forgiveness of all their sins. Order our days in your peace, and command that we be delivered from eternal damnation and counted among the flock of those you have chosen. Be pleased, O God, we pray, to bless, acknowledge, and approve this offering in every respect. Make it spiritual and acceptable, so that it may become for us the body and blood of your most beloved Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. On the day before he was to suffer, he took bread in his holy and venerable hands, the eyes raised to heaven to you, O God, his almighty Father. Giving you thanks, he said the blessing, broke the bread, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and eat of it, for this is my body, which will be given up for you. In a similar way, when supper was ended, he took this precious chalice in his holy and venerable hands, and once more giving you thanks, he said the blessing and gave the chalice to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and drink from it. For this is the chalice of my blood, the blood of the new and eternal covenant, which will be poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in memory of me. mystery of faith. celebrate the memorial of the blessed passion, the resurrection from the dead, and the glorious ascension into heaven of Christ your Son, our Lord. We, your servants and your holy people, offer to your glorious majesty from the gifts that you have given us, this pure victim, this holy victim, this spotless victim, the holy bread of eternal life, and the chalice of everlasting salvation. Be pleased to look upon these offerings with a serene and kindly countenance to accept them as once you were pleased to accept the gifts of your servant Abel the just, the sacrifice of Abraham our father in faith, and the offering of your high priest Melchizedek, a holy sacrifice, a spotless victim. In humble prayer we ask you, almighty God, command that these gifts be borne by the hands of your holy angel to your altar and high in the sight of your divine majesty, so that all of us who through this participation at the altar receive the most holy body and blood of your Son, may be filled with every grace and heavenly blessing. Remember also, Lord, your servants, who have gone before us with the sign of faith and rest in the sleep of peace. Grant them, O Lord, we pray, and all who sleep in Christ, a place of refreshment, light, and peace. To us also, your servants, who though sinners, hope in your abundant mercies, graciously grant some share and fellowship with your holy apostles and martyrs, with John the Baptist, Stephen, Matthias, Barnabas, Ignatius, Alexander, Marcellinus, Peter, Felicity, Perpetua, Agatha, Lucy, Agnes, Cecilia, Anastasia, and all your saints, admit us, we beseech you, into their company not weighing our merits, but granting us your pardon through Christ our Lord. Through whom you continue to make all these thing, good things, O Lord, you sanctify them, fill them with life, bless them, and bestow them upon us. Through 
Elohim and with them and in him. O God, almighty Father, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor is yours forever and ever. At the Savior's command, informed by divine teaching, we dare to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day. Deliver us, Lord, we pray, from every evil. Graciously grant peace in our days, that by the help of your mercy, we may be always free from sin and safe from all distress, as we await the blessed hope and the coming of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Lord Jesus Christ, who said to your apostles, Peace I leave you, my peace I give you. Look not in our sins, but in the faith of your church, and graciously grant her peace and unity in accordance with your will, who live and reign forever and ever. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. And with your spirit. Let us offer each other the sign of peace. Behold the Lamb of God. Behold him who takes away the sins of the world. Blessed are those called to the supper of the Lamb. Lord, the Lord, the Lord, the Lord, the Lord, the Lord, the Lord, the
For those of you at home who are unable to receive our Lord sacramentally today, I hope you can join us now in making an act of spiritual communion. My Jesus, I believe that you are present in the most blessed sacrament. I love you above all things, and I desire to receive you into my soul. Since I cannot at this moment receive you sacramentally, come at least spiritually into my heart. I embrace you as if you were already there and unite myself wholly to you. Never permit me to be separated from you. Amen. Father Chris, you were talking a little bit earlier about those graces on uh, Mercy Sunday. Yeah, and this might be a, a great time as we are receiving Holy Communion to mention the uh, grace that our Lord promises and a lot of questions always ask well, what do we have to do and can non-Catholics can receive this so what what the church is taught as we we follow the words of St. Faustina in the diary number 699 that the soul that has been to confession and again as we mentioned that could have been uh, days ago or even last week if or during Lent as long as you're in a state of grace and now the soul that receives Holy Communion uh, will receive the grace of, if not only all forgiveness of sins, but Father Joe, a lot of people don't realize, um, you know, uh, coming out of the confessional, unless we have perfect contrition, um, we may have to detach and have some consequences of those sins. And that's the punishment that I, I I choose the word loving discipline from our Lord, but this is a chance to wipe even that away. Mm -hmm. And um, what an amazing gift we have. And you just read the spiritual communion. I think this is important because for the homebound um, that cannot receive uh, communion sacramentally, they can join in the spiritual communion that we just read, just asking God to be united in their heart and if you were unable to get to confession for whatever reason, you can make an act of contrition, um, just telling God you're sorry, and for Catholics, with the promise to return to the sacrament as soon as possible. Now for non-Catholics, um, we teach that the best thing they can do is to make an act of contrition, telling God they're sorry, and also a form of spiritual communion, just asking God to come into their soul, to be united. So I think, Father Joe, there's nobody not included in this beautiful day. Absolutely. The Lord wants us all to be included. Now, Father Chris, you know that I live in Rome, of course, so I traveled from Rome uh, to be here today. And so I always like to see what the Holy Father does on Mercy Sunday. I think last year he was at the Church of the Holy Spirit in Sassia, which is uh, near the Vatican, and it's the official Divine Mercy Shrine for Rome. He didn't have a public uh, mass today on Mercy Sunday. He's been a little under the weather in and out of the hospital. But he did talk about Mercy Sunday in his Angelus message. He mentioned that Church of the Holy Spirit in Sassia, the Divine Mercy Shrine in Rome. He mentioned John Paul II. And he also talked about the Gospel of today, St. Thomas. And he says a lot of us are like St. Thomas, doubting and uh, afraid and, and uh, having our doubts. But he said an interesting thing. All the other apostles were in that upper room on Easter Sunday, afraid and hiding. Thomas went out. Thomas had at least the courage to go out and be, uh, e even though he could have been arrested, he was out there. But then when he was reconciled with the Lord, when he said, I need to see those wounds, well, Jesus showed him what he needed to see. And where, where did the reconciliation took place? In the community of the apostles, in the community of the faithful, so in the church. So we're not gonna find our, our, our um, resolutions of problems outside of the church, but it's in the heart of the church where Jesus reconciles us and brings us back as he did to Thomas. And Father, before we go back to listen to the beautiful choir, I think it's awesome to point out that it was St. Thomas who in the apostolic constitutions mm -hmm. wrote that the Lord showed me mm. that we need a feast on this eighth day. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and he's referring to this gospel because mm -hmm. In the Holy Scriptures, it says on the first day of the following week, meaning mm -hmm. after the resurrection, 
the first day of the week was Sunday mm. to the Jews. So we are talking about the first Divine Mercy Sunday oh, yeah. when our Lord entered into the cenacle, into the upper room. And it was Thomas, as we just heard, that our Lord showed the power uh, of his mercy. And so Thomas then gives us in the Apostolic Constitutions this awareness of the importance of the eighth day, mm. uh, that we need this great feast. And mm. later, saints such as St. Gregory Nazianzen and St. Augustine called it the most important day of the octave. And Father, it's not because it's greater than Easter. This is all one day in our church celebration of an octave. But as Father Seraphim used to teach, um, Easter Sunday is about redemption. Divine Mercy Sunday is about salvation. Right. And on Easter Sunday, our Lord opened the door to heaven. But on Divine Mercy Sunday, we walk through that open door. And that's why eighth, eight, number eight represents eternity to the Jews. It's the day we will end our lives and meet our Lord. So what a gift. Yeah, for the Jews, the first and the last days of the, of the octave are the most important ones. And the Lord, he's got nothing else to hold back. So he wants to give it all out today on that last day. He's so generous. And the Pope pointed out that when uh, Jesus was reconciling Thomas, he showed him his wounds. And even in his resurrected body, those wounds remain. And those wounds are a sign of his love. They're the channels of his mercy and his grace. And they can, that grace continues to flow from Jesus' heart. Perpetually present before the Father. Well, this is why the Lord, um, our Lord Jesus Christ is the head. Uh, preceded us and we will follow as the body in the resurrection but now our Lord perpetually is before the Father um, with those wounds um, that give us through his divine mercy that everlasting life. Amen. Well as the distribution of communion continues uh, let's listen again once again to that beautiful polyphony choir of Magdalene College.
some of those choir members actually are considering a vocation to the priesthood of the religious life, so we should keep them in, in our prayers. And on this uh, beautiful Mercy Sunday, we don't want to forget our Holy Mother Mary. And St. Faustina would pray to Mary and ask her to help her to prepare to receive Holy Communion. It's a beautiful uh, quote from the diary, uh, 1114, where Faustina writes, Today, I felt the nearness of my mother, my heavenly mother. Although before every Holy Communion, I earnestly ask the Mother of God to help me prepare my soul for the coming of her son, and I clearly feel her protection over me. I entreat her to be so gracious as to enkindle in me the fire of God's love, such as burned in her own pure heart at the time of the incarnation of the Word of God. And Father Joe, she also talks a little later in the diary on 1392 that all the good in her is due to Holy Communion. She said, I owe everything to it. And what I like is she says, I feel that this holy fire has transformed me completely. Uh, she says, oh, how happy I am to be a dwelling place for you, O oh Lord. And I think that's what today is. Today can be a day of transformation. Um, if we're cleansed of, of all the stains that on our soul, you know, this, the wedding garment is our soul. And on that wedding garment, we can be stained. You know, sin and punishment, they, they stain our soul, our wedding garment. And, and so when our Lord comes for us as the groom, and we, the church, are the bride, um, you know, as we mentioned briefly earlier, eight, the number eight, we always think of seven as the perfect number to the Jews, but the number eight represents eternity. And what that means is on the eighth day is symbolic of us entering into eternity. So there Christ, our, our groom, will be waiting for us. Now, we all know a Jewish groom wanted his bride to be spotless. Mm. And so if Christ comes for us as the groom and we're the bride, we want to be spotless. So when we enter into that eighth day, this is the promise Jesus gives us to become transformed and spotless. Beautiful. Now some of the Psalms remind us of uh, the Jews going in pilgrimage to the temple, going in procession, and they would recite those uh, Psalms in procession on pilgrimage. And there's something on the Eucharistic Revival that uh, is reminding me of this. Uh, we spoke about this National Eucharistic Revival that the bishops have been uh, involved in, and, and next year they're planning a remarkable series of cross-country pilgrimages. It's called our National Emmaus Moment, where the faithful will process with our Eucharistic Lord through cities, along highways, and past rural towns on their way to the 10th National Eucharistic Congress in Indianapolis, Indiana. That'll take place from July 17th through 21st in 2024. And there are four starting points in the west from San Francisco, in the north, Lake Itasca, Minnesota, the headwaters of the Mississippi River, in the south, Brownsville, Texas, and here in the east, New Haven, Connecticut. And pilgrims will make their way with our Lord and converge in Indianapolis. The words of scripture come to mind. Large crowds followed him and he healed them there. That's from Matthew 19.2. And this will be an extraordinary moment in the history of the Catholic Church in America. So you can learn more on the official website, eucharisticcongress.org. And you know, Father, uh, none of this transformation that we're seeking in our world can happen without the Eucharist, at least from the standpoint of uh, Faustina saying, you know, uh, and one of my favorite passages in the Bible was, Faustina was uh, saying that Jesus told her, that if angels were capable of envy, <laughs> that they would only envy us for two reasons. And I always was captivated by this. One, that we can suffer, mm -hmm. and that allows us to share in the cross of Christ. But she said number two is that we can receive Holy Communion. Mm -hmm. The angels are spirit only. They cannot. We are body, soul, composite. We can let us not miss this grace. Yeah, there's something powerful about processions, Marian processions, Eucharistic processions. I remember in Poland, when they were under communism, they would continue to have um, 
Eucharistic processions through the streets of Poland on, on Corpus Christi, even if the communists were going to find them or they were going to try to shut them down, no, they were going to continue to do that to express who they were, to express their faith, their love for Jesus and the Eucharist. And it's a, it's a witness, too, to people who are saying, well, what's going on here? What, what is this monstrous? What, what, what is this? And so it's, it's, a, it's a way of showing our faith to the world. Yeah, and, and through St. Faustina's witness, it's, it's nothing new. This is just confirmation. In fact, a lot of people are surprised to learn divine mercy's not new. Um, mercy's been present since the garden, the fall in the garden, where Jesus promised us a savior and the gift of a mother. Um, but it's throughout the year, uh, the centuries, that we have been hardened of hearts, that we have been stiff-necked, that our Lord, as you see on your screen, brings us the beautiful gift um, that we have in the Eucharist in St. Faustina, as we see on the screen. Um, he, to her, he gave five channels of grace by which to reinvigorate us. And this starts, as we know the acronym Finch, F-I-N-C-H, the feast, image, novena, chaplet, and hour of mercy. It begins with the feast. And Father Joe, what a lot of people are, I think, looking for is some kind of magic wand, as I always say, or some rabbit's foot. All Divine Mercy Sunday is, is a return to the sacraments, a return to confession, a return to Holy Communion. And in fact, he knows us. He knows that if he gives us something in return, a grace will come. And that promise is this extraordinary promise of complete cleansing of sin and punishment. Yeah. There's a movie coming out now based on the book of uh, Father Gabriel Amort, that exorcist from Rome. And in his book, he talks about some, some really extraordinary exorcisms. But then what it comes down to is get back to your faith. Get back to the Mass. Get back to the sacraments. Get back to what you're supposed to do. And then the Lord will help us and protect us. But if we keep trying to find our, as, as Pope Francis said today, keep trying to find our salvation outside, we're not going to find right. it. And you know, Father, you mentioned that. An interesting point that I think shocks a lot of people is the sacrament of confession is more powerful than an exorcism. Hmm. Because the exorcism is, exorcism is technically a sacramental. So it's just amazing that the sacrament of, of reconciliation is greater than an exorcism, which is just a sacramental. Absolutely. Psychologists have said for a long time, I can only give people so much through counseling. I can't give them absolution. I can't give them forgiveness right. of sins. And that's what they're really looking for, people who are tortured and, uh, and uh, feeling that, that heaviness and depression. Yeah. And we're so grateful that all of our Marian helpers have uh, joined us here today on Eden Hill. After four long years of uh, not being able to celebrate in person due to local restrictions, we have now finally been able to do that. So we hope if you couldn't make it this year, you'll return with us next year. Um, come here and be part of this beautiful celebration. So let's uh, listen to the choir as uh, the uh, communion continues and we prepare for the uh, hour of great mercy.
Let us pray. Grant, we pray, Almighty God, that our reception of this Paschal Sacrament may have a continual effect in our minds and hearts through Christ our Lord. Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The Divine Mercy Novena, the first day. Today bring to me all mankind, especially all sinners, and immerse them in the ocean of my mercy. In this way you will console me in the bitter grief into which the loss of souls plunges me. Most merciful Jesus, whose very nature it is to have compassion on us and to forgive us, do not look upon our sins, but upon our trust, which we place in your infinite goodness. Receive us all into the abode of your most compassionate heart, and never let us escape from it. We beg this of you by your love, which unites you to the Father and the Holy Spirit. Amen. 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 
and especially upon poor sinners, all enfolded in the most compassionate heart of Jesus. For the sake of his powerful passion, show us your mercy, that we may praise the omnipotence of your mercy forever and ever. Amen. You expired, Jesus, but the source of all life gushed forth from the souls and the ocean of mercy opened up for the whole world. O font of life, unfathomable divine mercy, envelop the whole world and empty yourself out upon us. O blood and water, gush forth from the heart of Jesus as a fountain of mercy for us. I trust in you. O blood and water, gush forth from the heart of Jesus as a fountain of mercy for us. I trust in you. O blood and water, which gush forth from the heart of Jesus, as a fount of mercy for us, I trust in you. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with you. Blessed are you now among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. I believe in God, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of the saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting.
the eternal God, in whom mercy is endless and the treasury of compassion inexhaustible, look kindly upon us and increase your mercy in us, that in difficult moments we may not despair nor become despondent, but with great confidence submit ourselves to your holy will, which is love and mercy itself. Lord Jesus Christ, you gave us the Eucharist as the memorial of your suffering and death. May our worship of this sacrament of your body and blood help us to experience the salvation you won for us and the peace of the kingdom where you live with the Father and the Holy Spirit, God forever and ever.
Well, we're very happy to have you with us on Mercy Sunday. Father Chris, you wanted to tell us about something. Yeah, we are excited to tell you this year will be a continuation of our 18th annual uh, conference for healthcare professionals of Divine Mercy. They run the um, Divine Mercy, what's called a medicine, spirituality, bioethics, and spirituality conference, June 7th through June 9th of this year here at the National Shrine of Divine Mercy. You can register. There is academic credits. You can register at thedivinemercy.org slash healthcare slash conference. And it's another celebration of one of our apostolates. Yeah, we can't forget uh, uh, Dr. Brian Thatcher, who it's the 25th anniversary of the Eucharistic Apostles of the Divine Mercy Apostolate. We want to thank Dr. Brian for all he has done through the years. He continues to spread messages of mercy all over the world through his cynicals and he's traveling i think he's going to the south sudan this year so we'll pray for him and his family and all he does and we thank you to all of you most of all our marian helpers without you none of our work in this ministry and apostolate is possible on behalf of all the marian fathers in the united states which i can say representative and father joe for the marians worldwide around the world yes around the world and if you missed anything you can go to the website thedivinemercy.org everything is there there's an information number to 1-800-462-7426 so thanks for joining us God bless you, and we'll see you next year for Mercy Sunday. We look with delight upon the devout practices of the faithful. Draw near, we pray, to these your servants, and as they use these symbols of their faith and devotion, grant that they may also strive to be transformed into the likeness of Christ your Son, who lives and reigns with you forever and ever. And may these devotional articles be blessed, and may those who use them with faith receive the assurance of divine grace and protection in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. If the water didn't touch your uh, religious items, they all, all are blessed. Help us, O God, our Savior, and for the glory of your name, Lord, deliver us. Let your mercy, O Lord, be upon your servants as we have placed our trust in you. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. Let us pray. May the Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God and Son of the Blessed Ever-Virgin Mary, Savior and Master of the world, be merciful and favorable to you, and may he free you from every adversity, from any sickness, through the merits and intercession of the same Blessed Ever-Virgin Mary, his mother, and of Saint Maria Faustina, the secretary and apostle of his mercy. And may he grant you health of spirit, mind, and body for the praise of his most holy name. Through the intercession of Blessed Mary, ever Virgin, and of Saint Maria Faustina, may God free you from every present illness and from all evils of soul and body. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.
Divine Mercy and the Marian Fathers of the Immaculate Conception. I would like to thank His Excellency Bishop Bernard Schlesinger, Auxiliary Bishop of the Archdiocese of Atlanta, for celebrating the Feast of Divine Mercy with us today. We thank the Polyphony Choir of Magdalene College for providing our liturgical music for today's Mass and Chaplet of Divine Mercy. And we'd like to extend our gratitude to the Masters of Ceremonies, Assistant MCs, priests, and celebrants, especially Father Donald Calloway, our Provincial Vicar Superior, and deacons, seminarians, extraordinary ministers, servers, and all other participants in the liturgy. And we sincerely thank the staff of the National Shrine of the Divine Mercy, the Marian Helper Center, and all of our many, many volunteers for their countless hours and hard work for this Divine Mercy Sunday. And we thank all of you, thousands of pilgrims who joined in our celebration, even in the midst of all today's difficulties, both here on Eden Hill and those joining us through Eternal Word Television Network. As we leave this sacred place of Eden Hill, we wish you abundant blessings and safe travels with the protection of the Lord's holy angels as you return back to your destination. Thank you. You know, the, uh, those who have the final word at Mass are the laity when they say thanks be to God. So we'll dismiss here shortly, but I want to add my thanks to um, especially to the Marians of the Immaculate Conception for your warm hospitality for your vocation and for helping lead in this great apostolic work of St. Faustina and the course of our Lord and bringing the divine mercy to the world. The Lord be with you. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Now and for our help is in the name of the Lord. And may Almighty God bless you, the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Go in peace, alleluia. Alleluia.